I've moved to a new spot since I last talked to you. And now we're in chapters five, six, seven, and eight. And reading The Rocking Chair. Chapter five, you have the figure of a rocking chair right in the center of that chapter. And this guy Charlie is sitting in it. It's a chair where Daniel's father once had sat upon. In fact, Daniel's father and Charlie were good friends. We find out that Daniel, when he was young, he, he sat on that rocking chair. He considered this guy Charlie wise and after two months in seclusion in his house, mourning and drinking and avoiding uh, dealing with uh, the death of his family, Daniel finally comes out and he goes there. And Charlie's the kind of guy that doesn't even speak. They go for long periods with no talking, just rocking. And then Charlie asks him, look like you're going somewhere. Daniel just points to the mountains. He says, looking for answers. So in our own lives, we uh, may not know exactly where we're going, uh, but we ask the Lord to, to lead us and guide us to the best place to go. Even if we're in grief, even if we're puzzled, a bit lost in our life. So off Daniel will go and nothing has made sense really in his life except that he's he's got to move. He's got to say goodbye to it all, chapter six. And uh, you find out in the book that a lot of people are very fond of Daniel. And uh, he's quite popular, and for the two months, nobody saw him. They were wanting to reach out to him, but nobody saw him. Well, finally, Daniel just walks down the road, and he gets to a place on the way to the mountains where the accident was, and he sees all the bouquets have been laid out there for the last number of weeks, even some fresh ones laid there. And he just observes the accident scene, weeps, and then walks out of town and up into the mountains. We hear about a guy going into a bar on a routine of drinking and then going home to his family. And people have their routines, but sometimes the routine is not gonna work anymore because things have changed in our life. Chapter 7, Daniel's very unsure of himself except that he knows that he must go to the mountains. There's something calling him to that. And he is concerned that people may think that he's just running away from everything and just running to die. But he leaves a letter to make sure people know that that's not exactly what it is. He says, I'm not running away. I hope you know that that's not who I am. I confess I don't know what I'm running toward, but we go along in life and I wanna go along anymore. I can't just go along in life. I need to discover more. Chapter eight, Daniel walks out of that town and the last time anyone would see him He's disappeared, and it says year after year, nobody's heard from Daniel. You hear in chapter 10 that Daniel's father <clears throat> was visiting Charlie on his birthday, right there on that porch with the rocking chairs. Daniel's father says, I haven't, I haven't, I've gone up on the mountains looking for him. I haven't found him, but I think he's still alive. Yes. Uh, sometimes people disappear from from their routine or the places they went 
things they did or getting lost in working, getting lost in some hobby, getting lost in in something where they're not, they know they're not totally engaging in life. There's, there's something else, there's something more. And so chapter 11, the caveman, um, people begin to notice some kind of vagrant up in the mountains. Uh, the sightings become more common during the warmer months. And the legend grows that there's some man on the mountain, the caveman on the mountain. And that's what they call this figure. Um, and chapter 12, we get to the evening news. And there was a segment about this caveman figure. And there wasn't much to report, just that there was this mystery guy. And... The evening news chapter 12 is about a, a journalist that decides to pursue this story about this caveman or this chapter 13, we'll say a hermit. And she begins to interview people that have had sightings or quick little uh, conversations with this mountain man. And they describe him as a man who's just perfectly still and a man very much in commune with nature and uh, a man with a powerful true gaze that even push someone backwards. When he speaks, sometimes they don't know what he says. Um, something calm and melodious. They're not making out the words. It's almost like otherworldly. Uh, the caveman wasn't actually looking like a caveman. Yes, he had a beard and growth uh, with hair that was long, clothes mismatched, and yet he was rather uh, rather well well taken care of. It just seemed like he was naturally together. He didn't smell or anything like you might think a vagrant would. He was he was clean, and he was very clear of thought. And so, as they. Uh, have these sightings of him. Uh, the book takes you then to uh, to Charlie and then a friend called Javier, who was once Daniel's childhood friend, lifelong friend. And uh, it's, uh, they're realizing that this hermit guy is Daniel, but a lot of people aren't making the connection or maybe they don't wanna make the connection he has ascended to some other place. And and yet this is our Daniel from the town. But what's happened to him? He should be devastated still. What's happened? They have an encounter on page 24 in chapter 13 about a person who comes to him and Daniel already kind of sizes up this man's life and he goes, you know, get quiet. You have two futures in front of you. Now be still, close your eyes, and get lost in the possibilities. Pay attention to the decision you're leaning toward. Hold it in your mind. And then he says, Now focus on that, which you found in some inner peace, and follow that dream, follow that path. And not everything else that you've been doing for the last oh, three or four weeks. Your, your decision will be important of what your future will be, one future or the other. I think this is a, a book that's talking about uh, gaining inner peace, inner wisdom, inner clarity to the, for the life that you're meant to leave, the, the, the life that you're meant to have. And sometimes the breakthrough comes because something has jarred us or something has just redirected ourselves, but it's actually a favor from God. So we're now um, moving along in the book to chapter uh, 15, Healing and Hysteria. Hope you're enjoying it. So, so far in the book, we are having sacred silence as uh 
a focus of the book. Um, a silence that it's hard for us to get. It's hard for us to take. Modern society, everything is noise. Everything is filled up. Everything is distracting us. How important it is for people to, to get quiet. To come to the quiet. So you see Charlie on the, on the rocking chair and he speaks very little. It says he reads a lot. He reflects a lot. He takes time for the sacred hour, the sacred, the sacred uh, <clears throat> experience. And thus he sees things much more clearly. Javi that's come by has some experience of this, a little. And so the two of them conclude that, that Daniel's still alive. And in fact, Charlie says he's not only alive, he's, he's really alive, he's fully alive. He's in good shape. Javi, you don't have to go try to find him in the mountains and rescue this hermit caveman guy, rather he has probably a lot to give to you and when the time's right, Daniel's coming down the mountain to, to share it. But people are already running into him up there and finding a lot of answers. So Daniel has had all this quiet time to find peace and he has, he has drunk it in. He's drunk it in large. He has been, he has been transformed by the mountains, going up to the mountains. You know, there's some Psalms like Psalm 121, and go up to the mountains, you know, to experience God. Uh, some of it was about going up to Jerusalem, and experiencing that touch point where God made his covenants to Abraham and, uh, and the covenants to, to David and the covenants through history of through Jesus and the final new covenant. But come, come and be, be in that place where the encounter can happen. In the book, you have, uh, you have uh, Charlie say that there's a great need for people who have had the sacred silence and have become wise by it. They now have something truly to say to others and they can be great servants of society, even leaders or guides for us of where to go. Well, you and I, brother and sister, we, the more that we can experience the Lord, encounter him in sacred liturgy, but also in a silent prayer and in reflection in our life and just looking for God, seek the Lord and he shall be found. Draw to him and he shall be near. Knock and the door shall be opened. Our greatest dreams, the, the great future, the true future, the true self, we're seeking for it. <clears throat> and God is trying to open up that door. So are you knocking? If you're knocking, that means you're taking time to be with God. There's a entertainer that was once in Mason Prophet, a rock group in the 70s, and his uh name is John Michael Talbot, and he became a hermit uh, in the Ozark Mountains. And uh, he started a music ministry and a <clears throat> retreat place, and then he started traveling and playing his music. And now one of the great albums he did was Come to the Quiet. And a number of just wonderful uh, reflective music to share what he had found, uh, a strong conversion to Christ. So think about that in your own life. How are you finding it? One of the ways we do at the parish is we have a lot of holy hour time every Friday and first Saturdays. Uh, we try to get people just come into church and just experience quiet. We also know that some people need to dump things out of their life or look at things truthfully. And we offer confession at the same time. Have you ever considered that? Do you know that we've been doing it for years here? God is calling you to find it. Maybe not at this church in, in that manner, but God's calling you to find him deeply in the quiet.